All right, happy Arts in Our Schools Month, everyone. Yay! My name is Kwanise Floyd, and I'm the Executive Director of Arts Education at Maryland Schools Alliance, uh, also known as AIMS. And AIMS is committed to ensuring that all students in the state of Maryland have access to high quality arts education by mobilizing power to communities through advocacy programs, professional and leadership programs, and resource building and sharing. So all this month, AIMS is celebrating Arts in Our Schools Month by elevating educators and advocates kids from around the state, challenging you to advocacy activities and sharing resources. Every week, uh, we will be hosting Facebook Live conversations. This is our last week of our Facebook Live conversations. And over the past four weeks, we've had amazing artists, arts educators, teaching artists, education advocates, and policy makers. Please be sure to follow us on all social media platforms. Our username is ArtsEdMaryland. Use the hashtag ArtsInSchoolsMD and hashtag WeAllDeserveArts to follow along and join in on the celebration and the fun. And so this week, we have an amazing panel of education advocates um, and policymakers to discuss how to influence change. Um, with us, we have Jamie Drayton from Baltimore City Parent. Um, Vernon Fays, Baltimore County Middle School Art Teacher and MSEA Rep. Michael Bell from Queen Anne's County Fine Arts Supervisor. Uh, Julia DeBusolo from Arts Every Day. And Leah Mann, who is a Baltimore City student. Um, they, are, they will introduce themselves in just a second. Uh, but I want to first say that I'm so excited to welcome Braden Hamilton. Braden Hamilton is a 10th grader at the Baltimore School for the Arts and is a member of the Baltimore Youth Arts Advocacy Council, facilitated by Arts Every Day. Um, so she will be my co-moderator for today's discussion. And Braden, please feel free to introduce yourself to our audience by sharing a little bit about yourself and your role in the arts education ecosystem. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Braden Hamilton. Um, I'm a student at the Baltimore School for the Arts, and like she said, I'm in 10th grade. Um, I play the clarinet, and um, I'm also a part of the Be More Youth Arts Advocacy Council. Um, so there are eight council members, and uh, one adult that supervises us, her name is Miss Ashina. And the council is inaugural meeting was held in January 2021. It was established by Arts Every Day to provide a platform for Baltimore City youth creatives in grades 10 through 12 to learn about impact in school policy making. Uh, the BYAAC's mission is to ensure that every school and district provides equitable access to arts education and experiences for every student in every grade in alignment with the fine arts plan that was adopted by the district in 2018. Um, so my role in the, arts, um, in the arts ecosystem is that I'm a student first, which means I go to school every day in Baltimore City Public Schools. Um, then I am a artist second. So I do play the clarinet. I take extra classes um, and that's just what I do. So that is my role. And I'm also an advocate, which means I really, really, really care about the arts. And I try my best to spread the message that arts matters and that we really deserve a great quality of arts education in our schools. Awesome, thank you. And now with us, we have Vernon Faines, Julia DeBusolo, Michael Bell, Jami Drayton, and Leah Mann. So um, we're gonna start off um, with you all. So can each person take about two minutes just to give us a brief, brief introduction of themselves and where they are within the arts education ecosystem. And I'll start off with Julia. Hi, Kwanis. Hi, Brayden. Thanks so much for having me here today. Um, my name is Julia DeBuslo. I'm the director of Arts Every Day. We are an organization that advocates for equitable access to the arts in Baltimore City Public Schools specifically. Um, we also work in close partnership with Kwanis, Rachel, Kate, everybody at Ames uh, to make sure that the arts are not forgetting, forgotten um, at the state level. Um, and we're just thrilled to be here today. Thanks so much. Awesome. Michael, we'd love to hear from you. Sure. And I'd love to say welcome to Braden and Kwanis. I think it's awesome that you're bringing her on board for this experience at such a young age. So she's uh, just starting her journey. Me, uh, with my journey, I'm a supervisor of visual and performing arts in addition to world languages, school library media for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. I'm also an artist, an author, a TED speaker, visual journaling pioneer, and a former three-time national award winning teacher of the year. 
in my current role as supervisor in Queen Anne's County, I'm just here doing what I do best. Um, trying to take things to a whole other level, championing our teachers as best I can and making them the rock stars. But in order to do this, what I figured out was first they needed a game. So my first year I created art scene, which was the district's first ever K to 12 student art exhibitions that kicked off at both high schools on different days, the same week, like fireworks at both ends of the district. It was so cool. And from there, it just exploded. We launched our first ever national art and national dance honor societies. Students earned their first ever scholastic awards. We had back-to-back -back state art winners. We graduated student artists from their first ever AP 2D and 3D art and design courses in Queen Anne's uh, history. We then went on to achieve all state and band back to back. We had an all state dancer. So it, it's been like a lot of firsts. And from there, uh, we had two back to back teachers of the year in the arts, Heather Eflin in music and Amber Wright in uh, dance, which are giving them a shout out. And we were just awarded the 2020 best communities of music education out of 754 districts nationwide. So we've done a lot. We formed a lot of great partnerships and I just like to give them a shout out. Our, our partners at the Queen Anne's County Arts Council, Kifa Academy Art Museum and uh, myself, I've just been busy doing it for the teachers, doing the workshops and keynotes across the state and across the country for the Maryland Art Summit, New Jersey Art Education. I did their keynote for the statewide conference. And just recently, the NAEA's uh, first ever virtual national art convention. So just here, spread my passion for the process and the importance of arts for all of us. Thank you for sharing that. Jimmy, I'd love to hear from you. Please introduce yourself. You know, I don't want to kind of go after him. He just he just uh, laid it out there. Um, he was at the Grammys. I didn't know what was going on. I said, can we bring him to Baltimore City so my kids can get some art? But that's a whole nother thing. Um, so my name is Jimmy Drayton. I have three children in city, city schools. Um, all three of my children go to a Title I school, Montebello Elementary and Middle School. And I have been a, I was a former fundraiser for Ames. Um, and that's how I really was immersed in the arts at Ed World in the state of Maryland. And then after I left Ames, I just continued my advocacy, you know, mainly for my children, but getting other parents to know what we're missing in the city, right? Getting them to know that as soon as you leave our walls, um, our imaginary walls, there is a vast education world rich with arts education opportunities in the state of Maryland, right? And I love the fact that, first of all, we're so close to DC and you get to hear the advocates from across the nation talk about how Maryland has the best arts education in the nation. And Baltimore City, we don't, a lot of our children don't get access to that until they get to a BSA, right? And then by then it's too late because it's hard to catch up those years of orchestra, right, training. It's hard to catch up those years of, of, of singing and dancing. I mean, it would break my heart when I would see like dance competitions right there in Towson that were open to our city kids and no one knew about it. You know, the teachers didn't know about it. You know, it just would blow my mind. So advocacy for me, and just to let everybody know, I actually started off in MCPS with my children. My children went to school in Bethesda and that I shouldn't have done that. Cause I, <laughs> you, you, you realize early on that things become so normal that you don't realize what other people don't have. And then when we went to Baltimore City, I said, wait, where did the honors orchestra go? Where did the honors chamber of music go? Why don't my kids get access to basic music classes in elementary and middle school? Like why aren't these basic, you know, visual art techniques? This is not something that is foreign to the state of Maryland. So that's how I got started. Um, it has been a rough journey as most of you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I'm just happy to be here, really and truly. I've known Kwali since we were students at Howard together. Um, and I've known Julie. I've worked with Julie really closely. I actually am currently, I've been a PTA president, a PTA community service chair member. And now I am a, uh, on the board for PCAB, which is the Parent and Community Advisory Board, which advises city school CEO and the Baltimore City Board of School Commissioners 
on what parents and family and communities member want to help our youth succeed. And I am constantly banging the wagon saying, our kids need more art. These teachers need more help on understanding what the opportunities are and how we push our students forward. So that's my piece. And I, I thank Michael for all his work because uh, we, we need you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Leah, we'd love to hear from you. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah Mann. I'm a freshman at Baltimore City Schools. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm a freshman at Baltimore City College. I'm 14 years old. Um, I'm a student, of course. And for me, the arts have kind of always been in my life. When I was younger, I did dancing. Um, as I got older, I would paint more. I was doing more of like sculptures, that whole type of thing. And yeah. That's me. Thank you. And Vernon, love to hear from you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, shout out to Leah Mann. Go Knights. I'm a City College graduate uh, uh, almost 40 years ago, though. But, <laughs> but it was great to hear that you're from City College. Um, I am a Baltimore County visual arts teacher. I teach in middle school, um, Pine Grove Middle School in Baltimore County. Um, and I'm also an adjunct professor at Townsend University. I teach two reading courses, um, integrating arts and visual arts and textual um, literacy. Um, with MSEA, um, Kwanis mentioned earlier, my connection to MSEA, I am on the President's Advisory Council for Equitable and Safe Environments, School Environments, as well as uh, NEA Leaders for Just Schools and um, on our Teachers Association, uh, Baltimore County. Um, I am on the board of directors, but I also serve as their their uh, Minority Affairs Committee um, chairperson. Um, so I have a lot of, of different roles that touch on advocacy. I think ultimately I'm inspired by our young students and, and what they bring into the classroom. Um, and I think it's one of my goals to encourage compelling and impactful art experiences and give them a space for their authentic student voice. Um, I have a new role with the Maryland Art Education Association, which is, is thrusting me a little further into advocacy as the VP of advocacy. So I'm looking forward to connecting with um, partners like Ames and others here in Maryland who are already doing the work, but, but connecting educators and students more through um, through my connections. Um, advocacy, advocacy has a broad reach, just like the arts. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that I think I enjoy the most is reimagining curriculum, uh, making sure it's balanced and holistic in nature, um, and, and then also working with pre-service teachers or expiring educators and making sure they understand the value of arts education in our public school system. Thank you. I'm going to pass it over to Braden for our next question. Okay, so uh, uh, with the help of Machina and my colleagues, I have learned so much through workshops and guest speakers. So as far as the Advocacy Council, our first week, we did a lot of workshops um, learning about arts advocacy and just advocacy in general. And in the process, um, we worked with the Maryland Music Associate, uh, Arts Association, so like we have to talk to them. So uh, yeah, so my, like, my question for you guys is what is a story you can share of a successful advocacy or your lived experience of the power of standing up for what's right? And what was the roadmap of your advocacy process? Because for me personally, I like to hear different perspectives, perspectives and different opinions and different processes to see what works best for me at the end of the day, because I'm not sure what works best for me yet. And I think when I'm hearing a lot of people talk about it and I try different ways, I get to find out what's best for me. So I was just curious about that. Anyone can unmute. All right, sure. I'll jump in. So, uh, you know, Quanis, Braden, I've got throughout my career more stories that you'd probably ever want to have around standing up for what's right. Um, I think it's all kind of born out of that. You know, it's born out of the, the struggle. What I've learned is that if you want to create true systemic changes, you really got to do it from within. You got to be fearless, fighting for what's right. 
and you've got to challenge the process. You got to be a voice for the voiceless and surround yourself with people that are going to continue to help you learn and grow. That's so important. You know, one thing that I've seen along my travels and just surrounding myself with some of the nation's best, they all have this common thread. Okay. They, they all just know how to read a child's story. That's been the one thing that all the great teachers I've come in contact with have all had in common. They know how to read a child's story. They know how to script some confidence onto their blank pages and make the kind of difference in a child's world that might not have been possible without them. And so that, that really became my why and why it is that I do what I do. But since you asked for a story of a lived experience, I'll, I'll share a deeply personal one. And it relates back to how important is it to be able to read a child's story. So this one's my son's. He was diagnosed with autism at age seven and subjected to uh, an inordinate amount of bullying throughout his elementary school years. Help was just nowhere to be found. And the breaking point for me and my wife was when he came home from school one day with his art project of all things. And it was a painting of a large sun with the word brave written across it. And I asked him why brave? And he said, dad, I'm brave every day because I have to go to school and I have to sit across from those same kids those same kids that were constantly bullying him. So that was it for us. My wife and I took turns burning through our sick leave, going to sit with him during lunch so he wasn't sitting alone. And so we knew he was safe. We kept this up until we were asked not to. And finally, we just decided to put our house up for sale, leave that district, embark on a brand new life for our son, and me embark on a brand new career as a supervisor. So in terms of what specific roadmap for my advocacy, you know, we lived and breathed it. So the struggle was real, but you can't give up and you still have to find ways to celebrate the little small successes that you make along the way and still inspire hope, make the uncomfortable decisions. And I'll add this just to, in closing, despite the fact that I was an art teacher in the same system as my son, his artwork was never selected for any shows. So my very last art contest entry I ever submitted on behalf of any student before leaving teaching was my son's. I entered him in this Artists Without Limits contest for artists with disabilities, and he was awarded an executive citation uh, for a work entitled, I'm sure you can probably guess it, Brave. I, I agree totally with Michael's assessment, and, and I wanted to share something along that line. So I don't think I have a specific story, but this is kind of a collection of stories that, that happen over time. Um, you have to challenge so many things in order to advocate for the arts. I had a friend tell me uh, long ago when I first started teaching to uh, advocacy is a daily thing. It's something you have to do daily, no matter how small or how big. You have to celebrate your colleagues that are in art education. You have to celebrate your students as much as possible. Just like Michael talked about celebrating his son. That is so important to be able to, to, um, to give the work and the student's presence and visibility in the community. And those are the connections we have to make. Um, another thing is to, to, um, to advocate for resources. So I find it, it, that in my career, I have often um, had to justify what materials and resources my students deserve, and they deserve all of it. <laughs> so we have to, as educators, constantly making sure that our students have what they need to, to be expressive, to, sh to, to tell those stories. Many of our students have those stories that we don't get to hear them or see them because we don't give them the space, that brave space to tell that story. And that, that is advocacy to me at its core, being able to provide the space for, for everyone to flourish and to be celebrated. So I, I will mention from a parent perspective, um, I did not mean to advocate. <laughs> that wasn't my initial. <laughs> I just didn't understand why people were telling me something was strange, like having music class with instruments. You know, stuff that just did not quite make sense to any person with a brain. Um, and people would tell me, you know, that's crazy. And what I realized is that a lot of my other parents, they just simply did not know what they didn't know. So a lot of what I was trying to do was not tell people I know it all because I don't. 
all I know is that this is what other children in the same state are receiving, and this is what we can advocate for. So money is one thing. I think we, we focus a lot on financial resources, right? Especially in the city where money is tight, it's always a grab. But I think a lot of the things that I would try to get our parents to, to identify is really that roadmap, right? Um, like what, what Michael and Brennan were saying was, you have to have a strategy before you start asking for stuff because it can be all over the place. And a lot of our parents, you know, we had classes for our students. We'll get classes one year and then the next year the classes will be taken away. Then you have theater and then the next year the theater will be taken away. And what we realized is we needed something that was more consistent. So other jurisdictions, they had an actual consistent method. And Baltimore City, unfortunately, we still don't have that right now, right? So we're trying to work the best we can with the with the things that we're given. And I think that's where my advocacy just keep keep pushing really and truly. Like no matter what people say, the principals, the teachers, the school system, the board of commissioners, I really just don't care anymore. I just keep pushing. I keep telling other parents hey, you know, a clarinet ain't that strange of an instrument for kids to, to pick up. You know, hey, you know, Morgan's up the block. If, you know, we can get them to update the website, we can know what type of community programs are going on. Hey, you know, this is the opportunities. And it's not to poo-poo anybody. It's really the same. We have amazing kids in the city. People might not act like they know it, but we have BSA in the city. You know, we have these amazing programs and it shouldn't start at the high school level. We should give these same opportunities to students that want, we have a truancy issue, we have a literacy issue, we have math issues, we have an engagement issues. And as a PTA president, it always amazes me when people say we have these issues and parents aren't involved. But I can tell you as a PTA president, when there was art night, that place was jammed packed with parents coming out and grandparents and community members and local businesses coming out to see these children and their artwork. And I can only imagine if these students had those opportunities to enter contests. A lot of them, we're not even told about them in the city. So for me, advocacy, advocacy starts at education and really just pushing. Something might not work this year, but we're gonna try something different next year. I'll, I'll jump in after <clears throat> Jimmy. I'm also a Baltimore City parent, and um, when I first joined Arts Every Day in 2012, I was at an opening for the Baltimore Design School, which is this incredible space. If you've never been in it, it's a converted um, uh, factory building, and it's just beautiful. And I ran into a member of the school board who is no longer a member, so <laughs> I won't mention any names. And I said, hey, Mr. School Board Member, what are, what's the plan for improving uh, access to arts education? And he just kind of like looked at me with a blank stare because he was also a parent in the system. And he said, what's the problem? We don't have a problem. And I was like, are you kidding me? And, you know, go to find out. He goes, all of his kids go to Roland Park, <laughs> uh, which is the one school with with sequential arts education in the wealthiest neighborhood of the city. And so, you know, that that was such an eye-opening moment for me, because if I hadn't said something um, at, at that moment in time, I don't I don't know that I truly would have understood the the role of of data and storytelling in really making disparities, um, equity, um, issues of, of just, um, just a, a, a lack of equity across the district and, uh, and, and broken promises to, to families, you know, that it's just, it's unconscionable <laughs> that we don't have systemic virtual, uh, visual art and music in every single school um, in the same way that, that the surrounding counties do. And, you know, I've been looking a lot at our high school uh, course data as well. And, you know, Baltimore School for the Arts should not be the only school in the city where you can get a comprehensive arts education. It, it just, it should be offered in every single high school. Um, and so um, much like Jim, Jimmy, that, that really helped me crystallize what we needed to show and who we needed to talk to um, because it was 
five years down the road where we just kept going back to the school board. We were never invited. We just kept signing up and we would show up. We would give our two cents. We would make data presentations and, um, and then we would invite people to conversations um, that, that uh, we would host with our um, collaborators and community partners. Um, so nobody is ever going to ask you for your opinion. Um, so you have to figure out clever ways of inserting it, <laughs> um, whether it's just showing up and just being really, really consistent in your messaging, um, or it's, you know, finding that one person who can be a champion within the school board, within the administration, and making your own opportunities to, to get the word out and make the case for, for arts education. Um, for me, uh, when was it? I want to say a few years back when I was in elementary, our music class was buckets from Home Depot and drumsticks. And I think it might have reached the news once or twice, but um, yeah, and our art classes were scrambling for crayons and hoping that we got enough paint this year, you know what I mean? And I think it's, it's not enough and it's not fair to city students when the rest of the state is like the art programs are thriving and it's, it's just not acceptable, it's not okay. And I think that, for me, advocating for arts is one of the most important things in the city right now for students to have an outlet for them to be creative in times like this and have an outlet for them to, you know, to be themselves. And, um, It's, it needs to get done, it needs to change, and we need to do better for our students, for sure. Yeah, it, it, Leah, it breaks my heart to hear that because um, we have to advocate more and in so many different ways and, uh, because so many of our students are missing out on tremendous social and personal benefits of visual arts. Um, skill development, uh, the, the opportunity to, to, to develop their identities and to, to express, understand and appreciate the identity of others. Uh, uh, just thinking about criticality and the, the ability to challenge and question through their art making and through learning about art, applying that new knowledge. And if we don't give our, our students that, then they're missing so much. Um, we're often the first thing on a chopping block, especially during times like this, trying times, uh, the pandemic, uh, budget cuts, things like that. Um, one thing that we did in Baltimore County uh, a couple of years ago, because we started to see our budgets in certain places, not looking the way it should, was we, we have, have your students create something amazing. And then someone will question, well, how did they do that? What did it take to do that? And then start to tally what it takes, what it cost to get that amazing output. It costs money to, to buy materials, to, to offer the professional development to educators, to learn new things, uh, to, to, to work on curriculum and to bring new life into, um, into a classroom. It, it, it does cost. And I hate going back to the money part, um, but <laughs> it's, it's a very necessary piece. So um, I think I've heard two people say this. I cannot remember who, but um, I heard you guys were talking about the Baltimore School for the Arts and how that is like the um, the art school we have in the city. And it's true, but we have an extremely high amount of students coming from outside of Baltimore City that go to our school. And it's like stuff, not many people would know that if you didn't, you know, pay attention to the school. But BSA does have high entry requirements. So with those high entry requirements, so most city students aren't meeting them because they don't have the proper training to meet them. So then we end up having a high amount of students coming from DC, Prince George's County, Montgomery County, like but the lower part of Pennsylvania. Like it's, it's, it's really starting to pick up. And I think the solution is not BSA lowering their, their um, entry requirements. I think the solution is to just place those arts curriculums inside of the schools so that people can get to that level. 
and it, will, it won't be a problem to so say it's like, oh, you know, BSA is not doing this, BSA is not doing that. When it's like the problem is not the entry requirements, the problem is that people are not being prepared to get to the point they would like to be to. Well said, Brayden. That that was exactly on point. And you know, Jimmy and I grew up in New York City, and you know, when we came down here to the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, uh, you know, I I didn't know that there was only one high school focused on arts. Like growing up in New York, there was a arts high school on every single corner. Like we had a lot of options. I, I graduated from a performing arts school. So, uh, you know, just coming down to this area and seeing that there's one arts school in every district is it's it's disheartening for me. Cause I feel like it, it like you said, Braden, it does cut off access to folks who would want to be a part of arts programs. So thank you for saying that. I agree. Can I, I just, also think, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jimmy. Go ahead. I just wanted to, to chip in really quickly, Brady, and let you know that I, I think I left Ames in 2015, 20s, 2015, 2016. We knew that was a problem back then. So that's not a new issue of people coming from out of the city. That's one. And then the second part is for me, it's never been, first of all, BSA needs high standards because you have to excel to excellence, right? That's something, and, and kids can do it. It's not like they have to lower their standards. Kids can practice. They can meet those excellent requirements. The problem is no one is saying that in the elementary and middle school levels that they deserve that same level of excellence that kids can come up to. So if you, I know Leah mentioned those bucket drummers, girl, they brought that out at my school. I threw a fit that they thought they were going to get away with a little grant and come out from Home Depot and try to tell me that was music for my child. As if I didn't just finish touring the state and seeing kids with full on violins playing like they were in a harmonic, like in a full scale orchestra and in sixth and seventh grade. It's like, what do we think our kids are worth? I'm, I'm sorry. You, you said it way better than I was gonna say it. I was, I was gonna actually allude to the fact that it starts way earlier than that. And if we don't provide the opportunity and resources for our elementary kids to, to meet certain standards, then they're not gonna be ready for these programs. So we have to look at earlier. Um, and, and that's one of the things I, that concerns me a lot lately is the advanced academic classes, art classes uh, or arts that, um, that so many students are not able to or, or not looked at to be part of, to participate in because they don't have the, those skills that they should have had coming before they got to middle school. Um, yeah. and Vernon, you know, you're right. I mean, and kids will rise to your level of expectation, whatever it is. And, you know, just briefly before you get to the next question, just speaking to that point. I mean, if we're talking about trying to do something for at what they label as at risk kids, you know, you don't, you don't help those kids and provide them the opportunities. Isn't it us that are really at risk? I mean, that's, that's the reality of, of, of what it is. Yeah, thank you all for, for that. This is a really robust conversation. And I, I, I just am really excited to have you all because this is really great. Um, so one of the things that you all talked about that was common was like your passion and your core values and how that plays into the work that you do as an advocate. And so, as you know, like society and societal interactions are made up of compromises. Um, and so that's also a part of like this advocacy work, right? Like coming up with compromising. And so I'm really thinking like, what is a way that we can uh, bring our goals across the finish line? Um, because we oftentimes have to come to a compromise in advocacy work, especially dealing with policymakers. So what is an example of a difficult situation you've had to deal with when you were trying to advocate for something you truly believed in? Well, as a supervisor, I've been advocating for hiring and retaining quality teachers to help build up programs because I've said it before and I'll say it again, it, quality teachers build quality programs. It's not the other way around. Um, how do we bring our goals across the finish line? I think it's simple. You know, our elected officials have to have skin in the game and for, for it to matter and publicity is king. Now, when it comes to publicity, you really have to know what it is that you do well, what you do best, what's your true identity. You know, Vegas certainly knows what Vegas does best. And for me, I like to sell the sizzle, uh, put it in everyone's faces, showcase a product that's worth showcasing on our programs. And if you wanna know why our elected officials make the decisions they make, I think that's also easy, follow the money. 
What do I follow? I follow stories, just like many of us are talking about here today. Stories and contest winners, scholarships, where the students go, what professions do they end up in. I've found that if you want to get a whole community behind you, the best way is to consistently show them. There's a power to that. There's a power in seeing a child being able to live out their dreams. Now, my boxing trainer, when I began getting my son trained in boxing so he could develop himself, he always told me, it's not what you tell him, it's what he sees. And the same rules apply to what it is that we do without the proper publicity for your community or your elected officials, you don't get a seat at the table and you run the risk of your programs being on the menu. And so, I mean, it's why I started up an Arts Teen of the Week column in the local newspaper. It's, I'm sure it's probably why Alicia Lee began her State Arts Leaders of the Month uh, Spotlight, the Embrace Workshops, and by extension, why you, Quanis, you know, brought us all here. Uh, because we all believe we can make a difference, and our work becomes an experience that just consistently needs to be unveiled. Uh, piggyback off of that, um, in addition to great PR, I think it starts with people like Brayden and Leah. <laughs> um, adults need to step up and step back and um, equip uh, young people with the, the tools, the information, the data points that they need to make their own case because um, some of the most compelling uh, moments in advocating for the arts over the last nine years I have seen has, has been when students are talking about what at the student level like how's that how's that impact me at my school um, and that's and that's extremely powerful and so uh, just wanted to lift that up I agree. I, every opportunity we can find as as parents, students, educators, um, we have we often we're often left out of the conversations. Uh, our voices are often excluded. Our perspectives are often excluded. I, I'm just thinking back about um, last year when COVID hit. The educators and the arts in general were left out of many of those conversations about how to move forward. And I believe in my heart that the arts got a whole lot of folks through um, this pandemic. Um, we were able to, to allow our students with very little resources to document and process the time that we're living in right now, um, to communicate what they were feeling and seeing and I, I, and I, I do agree with Michael and, and, and Julia, uh, visibility, presence are key. We gotta keep celebrating, keep pushing our, 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 uh, our agenda forward um, and encouraging folks to, to see the value in the arts. So I, I will speak really quickly. So Baltimore City, when it comes to parents, they actually ask parents a lot of questions. I mean, we get bombarded with surveys, bombarded with, and which is a good thing, right? They want to know what parents think. But the issue for me is that if parents have never been outside of Baltimore City Public Schools, they don't have anything to compare it to. There's no apples and oranges. So a lot of times, you know, we had a budget meeting um, where the principal said, do you want music or do you want yoga? And yoga is very beneficial to kids. And I'm like, wait a minute, that, that doesn't even make sense. First of all, music is not even on the chopping block. Let's let's stop that all together. And then two, what is your strategy for the next two or three years to say, this is what's gonna happen with the music class. They're gonna first get intro to music, right? Your basic understanding. And then we're gonna eventually seem to fundraise to get an instrument or two. Like, what does that strategy look like? And that's never implemented, right? Because every year that budget's on the chopping block. So it, it's like every year consistently, they can ask parents all they want, but if there's no strategy from the city behind it, it's not going to work in our favor. And parents have to be educated to know, even though I'm telling you that the music and theater and visual art is on a chopping block, 
In reality, that's not the case in Baltimore County. That's not the case in, I don't want to talk about Howard County. You know, I don't want to even talk about Baltimore County, you know, half the time. You know, this is the thing for me. You can ask someone, but if you're not giving them the education to say, by the way, your kids aren't getting this ever. It doesn't help us, right? It doesn't help us move forward. So that's the thing for me. You know, I, Connie told you, we went to Howard together and I remember seeing the band. People come back for the band. People come back for these art showcases. So in order, you, you can ask people, you can ask students to advocate, but even they don't know what they don't know, right? So it's to me a holistic community that has to come together and be educated first to say, this is what the opportunities are. And then from there, we can go on. I'm not an educator. I have no clue of what education training looks like in the state of Maryland. So how would I even know what a sequential curriculum looks like? Um, I think to get our goals across the finish line to have arts in all schools in Baltimore City, we need to know what the goal is. We need to list out what it is that we need to accomplish in each school, in each neighborhood in each grade level. And to remember that, to write those down, to know what you need in order for it to be implemented in these schools, in order for it to take your thought and turn it into action. You know what I mean? And if that's not done, then we're just we're just walking in a circle, essentially. I think that's that's what needs to happen to complete our goals and to get these students where they need to be regarding arts, of course. Okay, so our next question is, what advice do you have for people to advocate for all kids having arts education in their schools? I'll jump in, sure. Well, I attended a workshop this past February where one of our art teachers shared his personal story of having a father that was in and out of jail who was always in trouble with the law he said that their family used to take these midnight runs and whenever the father came home and they heard the words midnight run they had to pack one bag as quickly as they could take whatever would fit inside that bag and they would quickly move to another state that night often without much warning now he said it was his art teachers at every different school that he attended which were numerous that they were his lifeline for survival. He said they probably never knew it since he never had them for that long, but they were that thread connecting him to school for his entire reason for even showing up. I once taught a kid like that. For him, his story surrounded his sister that was shot and killed right in front of him at his ninth birthday party. I became his thread and keeping him connected, keeping him coming to school. And I say for legislators that are listening, making those decisions, imagine there's an entire system out there trying to cut that thread and you're it for them. The reason for someone's sustained existence. So for my, my advice for everyone advocating for kids to having art educations in the schools, make it personal, share your stories, become the leaders you're looking for. And after all, I mean, leadership, is really not a title or position, it's really a behavior. And arts education isn't just essential anymore. Now it's reconnecting kids to the world post COVID-19, socially and emotionally and beyond. So I, I think just remember this, your advocacy, it, it really begins with knowing deeply what it is that you are fighting for. Know, know that landscape well um, and instill belief even when there isn't any. For many kids, uh, they wear their stories on their sleeves. And if you actually take the time to, to look and read them, you know, their journey could be so much different. So you can use that as fuel. Um, I just think treasures, you know, they're often found in the unlikeliest of places. So um, look for them. I'm living proof of it. So uh, I, I champion and look forward to watching the journey of the young people on this panel as well. I wanted to emphasize what Leah had said 
during her last comment, and I'm sorry, I may have be having some internet issues. Um, hopefully I'm not glitching. <laughs> um, so uh, Leah, you mentioned that every school in Baltimore City needs to have a plan for expansion. And I think that is such great advice, especially for Baltimore City, because all of the decisions about budget are made at the school level as opposed to the district level. So I think advocacy in Baltimore City Public Schools really has to happen on a school level. Involvement in your school's budgeting process and um, making sure that you're following up with principals after they've presented the budget the first time, the second time, and the third time, because a lot of times, things get uh, edited out in between those three different presentations. Um, and um, also know what, what the, the budget guidance for the district is. Um, you know, we advocates have pushed to make sure that there is a uh, minimum teacher to student ratio requirement for all, all city schools for fine arts. Um, there's also a budget uh, requirement within that budget guidance um, for supplies and materials of instruction. Um, there's still not enough money to go around, period, coming from the, the state, and um, we're hopefully going to see some turnaround with uh, the Kerwin Commission coming through and the Blueprint for Maryland Schools. Um, but I, I think working with your school leaders and with PTO, PTA, and getting other students involved with um, meeting with your principal to say, what is your plan for fine arts? Um, what, are, how are we going to grow it systemically? Just like Jimmy said, that we're not just trying out a discipline here and there, but we're making sure that this is, that students are able to grow within that arts discipline year after year. Um, so, uh, that's that's a great great opportunity for people to get involved um, right here in the city. At the county levels, I know that a lot of that happens at the district level, and that's um, that can feel look and feel a little bit different. I agree. We we have to ask those hard questions more. What is the what is the plan for the earth? We we do have to ask that. I would also. Um, have those who make our decisions for us to encourage them to, to, to listen more to our students and those who are actually doing the work. Um, we tend to define our experiences by um, uh, the, the cultures we create and participate in. Um, it shapes our, our voice, it shapes our choices and our lives in many ways. Um, and I would just have them imagine a world without the arts imagine a world without creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship, and there won't be anything left. Imagine, imagine progress without the arts. Um, and that's, a, that's a question they really need to think about when they're making those cuts to programs and, and not providing a space for our students, uh, to nurture our students. Well, you know, for me, and I hope I'm answering this, question, because I almost forgot the, the question at this point, but in New York, you know, New York is the cultural capital of the world, right? So if you didn't have schools without access to the arts, you would not have a workforce eventually, right? You need somebody to be on Broadway. You need somebody to be in movie theaters. You know, I love a good law and order, but you need actors and actresses, right? You need directors. You need, you need these artists, right? You, you have Southern, like you have Christie's, you know, million dollar artwork. And the sad thing is Baltimore kind of has the same thing, right? Who's going to be the head of the Walters in a, in a few years? Who's going to be the head of the BMA? We're going to have to import talent because we're not training our students to be able to pick up a paintbrush. You know what I mean? We're not training our students to even prepare for scholarships to college, right? So we are really creating a deficit in the city of, quite frankly, the future of Black art because we're still a Black city. Like, it's, I don't want to say it's hurtful, but it really does grieve my spirit and hurt my heart to think that these students, I mean, the next Harlem Renaissance, you know, these things are going to be absent because it does not exist anymore. 
you know, for a lot of people, not everywhere, but for a lot of communities, communities that should be having music on the corners, you know, things that we used to have as a community that we don't see anymore just because ch children are not being introduced in churches, they're not being introduced in home, and they're not being introduced in school. And I will say this one thing, the organist in my church always blows my mind. She went to Frederick Douglass High School in Baltimore City, and she told me that when she was going to the school, there were so many people trained in piano that she didn't have to play. There were so many choirs you know, there was an option of art and she was able to get a full ride to Goucher and she wasn't the only one. And I'm just thinking like, what happens if we don't keep advocating to and keep pushing and saying, these children deserve the option to have these opportunities in school during the day, not after school activities and God bless them, I love them. And not, you know, supplemental activities from nonprofits. I love a good nonprofit. I've worked for nonprofits for years. But we need these activities in the school during the day offered by teachers, dare I say, who are qualified and educated in this profession and trained. And then getting professional development on top of that. You would never want a doctor who does not continue to get professional development. But first, you want them to be a doctor. You would not accept surgery from someone that went to online school for medicine. You want a real doctor. I don't know if that even exists, but you want a real doctor. You know, that's just what it is. And our children, quite frankly, deserve it. Um, I want to piggyback off of what Mr. Payne said about listening to students. If you want to know what they want and what they need in their schools, because they are the ones that are going to school, they make the school, then you need to listen to them. You need to ask them, get them to answer your questions. Ask, oh, what, what type of instruments would you like to do the most? How long do you like to do this? Ask them the specific questions that you need to know. And it, whatever's, whatever they're doing now, it's just, it's not working. It's not cutting it. So if you want a better arts, if uh, a better arts education in schools, if you want it to improve, if you really want to see change, ask the questions continue to ask the questions. There's plenty of students in Baltimore City Public Schools. There's plenty of people we can ask that will tell you exactly what they want. They'll tell you, I want blue paint, I want purple paint, I want pink, I want this, this, that, and the third. And you just need to ask, and you listen. Listen to what they're saying, listen to what they're telling you, and go get it done. That's it. You bring up an interesting point because often you see principals get polled, you get parents get polled, teachers get polled. How often do you see students get polled? They, they, often your voice is being interpreted through someone else. So you bring up a really, really interesting point. You're, you're way beyond your years. Be very successful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but this is a, a, a common theme with everything that you all said, and it's that we have to move collectively, regardless of where we are within this arts education ecosystem. All right, so we have to both push on the inside so that we have folks like Vernon and Michael and Jimmy, and then we have folks on the outside that we have to have pushing at the same time so that we can get our diamonds, right? Um, and so, you know, some of the main, like, themes that I've also come up with is people don't know what they don't know. What are ways that we can continue to inform uh, parents from around the state? Like your students deserve the arts. The arts are a core subject in the state of Maryland. How can we make sure you get the best arts that you can get for your child? Um, informing parents um, and the communities as well. Like what are we doing to partner with artistic communities around our school communities. I think that also has to be a part of that conversation. Giving students a voice, it's critical that we not make decisions without students. And that is, it sounds crazy to say that out loud, but I think that's what's been happening, right? Like we've been making decisions of smart students without student voice, which I, it's mind blowing to me. Um, and then also accessing the arts very young, like students shouldn't have to wait to high school to go into an arts program. That, that needs to start at pre-K. It needs to start at Head Start. And then we need to make sure that we're cultivating and creating that sequential uh, lead up to for them to potentially be in high school for uh, arts magnet program or going to college for a uh, conservatory program. Um, and then, yeah, then we all deserve arts. That's the last thing is we, our children deserve it. We don't deserve anything less than what they're, than what we deserve, right? Like we deserve the best, our children deserves the best, our communities deserve the best, our teachers deserve the best. 
we all deserve the best. So we're, if we're not meeting those standards of meeting the best, then we're not doing our jobs correctly. So we all have to really work together collectively to push that forward. Did anybody have any final thoughts before we wrapped up? I know that was a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you all guys for your uh, for your statements. I really, really enjoyed them. Um, and I wanted to build off something you said um, about the pre-K starting arts education at like pre-K and Head Start. I'm not really looking for, you know, Beethoven's and Mozart's. I'm looking for at least the opportunity for interest to open up because you never know if you like something until you actually learn about it. And, you know, and, and it's just like something, it shouldn't have to be an independent study thing because those are not independent studies. I mean, yes, there's some of those things you can do on your own, but these are all collaborative things. So that's something that you need to have a conversation with a teacher about somebody who um, is in your school who can talk to you about those kind of things. So it shouldn't be something that you have to go and find for yourself. So. so it sounds like we all need to get to building with one another, community building, nation building for, for the sake of our students. That's what it sounds like. So yeah, well, we are at the end of our conversation. First off, I just want to thank you all, um, Brayden, Leah, as the student voice on here. You know, it was such a, a, an amazing honor to have you two on here and letting us know what students really think, because we have to listen to students. <laughs> and uh, Michael, Julia, Vernon, and Jimmy, thank you so much for your uh, critical analysis of the field and the work that you all do every day on behalf of our educators and our families and our students. Um, and so that is it for our program today. Um, today is the last of our Facebook Live uh, sessions. Um, so, but we are still continuing our Arts in Our Schools Month celebrations. Um, we have social media posts that we post every day. We're, re we're featuring resources on Wednesdays and we have an advocacy activity on Thursdays. So please participate in that. Um, and then we have blog posts on Fridays. Um, if you miss any of our live conversations, they are on our Facebook page and they'll also be on our YouTube page and our Take Action page on our website. So once again, thank you all so much for this amazing convo. Thank you to all of our speakers over the past month that we've had and happy Arts in Our Schools Month and keep fighting the good fight. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you everyone, thank you. Thank you.